We'll come to the disclosure slide, and, and I said, uh, um, Andrea and I have no disclosures, but I actually lied in that slide. I do have a disclosure, and um, my disclosure is simply that I feel extremely privileged to be surrounded by physiotherapists, Nicole before, Andrea next to me, and Rod afterwards, and this is exactly how I've been practicing sports medicine for more than 10 years, 15 years, surrounded by physiotherapists, and I really want to acknowledge the physiotherapists and how much I have learned over the years from brilliant physiotherapists. So that's my disclosure. Um, and can I go to the objectives? So we will define femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, um, say a little bit about uh, morphology contributing to FII syndrome, and understanding the relationship between CAM, morphology, and hip OA. So can I ask a question? Who, what is wrong with the title of our talk? Why is, our, why is the title of our talk outdated? And this is how fast things are moving in this field. The title of our talk is outdated. So since going to press, shall I ask who, who wants to? Yeah, yeah, but why is the title out of date? So what's wrong with our title? I haven't put the title up there. You have to look. No. No. Yes. So the title is Femoral Stable Impingement is, is Femoral Cam Deformity a Silent Hip OA Epidemic Happening? So we don't speak of deformity anymore, but morphology. So that's, that's um, uh, one take home message done. So, and this, uh, this was actually in a newspaper in the UK on the day that we had the consensus meeting in Warwick two months ago. So there's an epidemic of hip and knee problems in, 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 um, in athletes doing uh, high intensity sport like sumo squatting and what they call um, uh, CrossFit. Uh, and that's led to, um, now I, I've heard what CrossFit is and it sounds absolutely horrible, but in any case, the, the, um, but it's fantastic for us and it's fantastic for orthopedic surgeons because uh, since between 2002 and 2013, the amount of keyhole hip surgery has risen by 730%, increased by 730% in the UK, and I don't think it's too dissimilar in the U United States. So there's an epidemic of femoral stable impingement syndrome in sport, also in hockey players and a number of others. So this was published in 2009, actually an interview with uh, a, an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Sierra, um, and it was published in the Journal of um, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And he says there, that it's uncommon to meet an orthopedic surgeon who does not know about FAI. However, it's difficult to diagnose. But, look on the right, Dr. Sierra explains that two treatment options exist for FAI. Open and arthroscopic surgery. So can you guess what, what these red lines represent? Tears. So, <laughs> So, and, and, and I googled Dr. Sierra and he does exist. So it's in Minnesota, so there's a job to be done uh, by, and I'm sure um, he's changed his, his, his mind about this. <laughs> so um, a job to be done to educate. There's more than only surgery when we look at FAI. So that's, the, that's a, an important message. So this is the Warwick Agreement on Femoral Stable Impingement Syndrome in an international consensus and we got together two months ago and this was a great meeting, orthopedic surgeons, radiologists, sports physicians, physiotherapists and the patient uh, sitting around a big table discussing and reaching consensus on a number of aspects around femoral stable impingement syndrome. The first thing is we added the, the syndrome aspect. Um, FAI syndrome is a motion related clinical disorder of the hip and you have to have three things to diagnose it. Symptoms, clinical signs, and imaging. So that's not rocket science. That's more or less how we diagnose anything. And it represents symptomatic, and that's the key, symptomatic premature contact between the proximal femur and the acetabulum. So what are the symptoms? The, the, motion, uh, the primary symptom is motion-related hip or groin pain. So pain is the primary symptom. But they can also have pain in the buttock, back, or the thigh. Um, and might describe clicking, locking, stiffness, catching, um, uh, restricted range of motion, and a sense of, of giving way. What are the clinical signs of FAI syndrome? The diagnosis of FAI syndrome does not happen, uh, depend on a, on, on a single clinical sign. Uh, 
But we know that hip impingement tests usually reproduce the patient's typical pain. But I have to say that the most common hip impingement test, the FADER test, the flexion adduction internal rotation test, is sensitive but not specific. So that's an important message from this consensus uh, statement. Often there's also limited range of motion of the hip and especially in internal rotation and in flexion. And then finally about diagnostic imaging. The only diagnostic imaging necessary to make the diagnosis um, are x-rays. And um, I want to emphasize that. We don't need MRI scans, we don't need CT scans to make the diagnosis of FAI syndrome. So only an AP pelvis and a lateral femoral neck x-ray is what the consensus meeting agreed on. But cross-sectional imaging might be indicated if you want further information about the, the hip joint and if surgery is, is, um, is possible. So what's the termin terminology that we should use and should avoid? And I've alluded to that earlier. We should use the term FAI syndrome and not symptomatic or asymptomatic FAI. If it's symptomatic, it's FAI syndrome. We should avoid uh, deformity, abnormality, lesion when referring to CAM or pincer morphology, but use CAM morphology and pincer morphology. And I actually had to change the title of my systematic review on this as well um, after the, um, after the uh, consensus. Review. This is a summary um, slide, and it's in the BJSM as well, published by the group also including treatment options, and I won't go into that. So emphasizing the, clinic, the uh, history, clinical science and radiology, and um, the definition of FAI syndrome. So it's important to understand the bony hip morphology contributing to FAI syndrome, and there's basically two um, uh, distinct bony hip morphologies that can either be in isolation or in combination. Morphology is just the shape of the bone, and we really don't know if this is truly abnormal um, and uh, Andrea will go more into that later, but because the prevalence of CAM morphology uh, is quite high in, in a number of uh, populations. What is CAM morphology? CAM morphology is literally a bony bump at the um, femoral head neck junction. That's the long and short of a CAM morphology. And we can go into detail why and how this developed, but I won't do that. Um, this is the definition of a CAM morphology. Pinson morphology is um, uh, excessive bone on the superior acetabular rim. Um, and you can imagine that when you have either the two, the one in, uh, or, or both in combination, that there might be an early impingement then of soft tissue between these bony elements that can lead to FAI syndrome or symptomatic symptoms, I mean. And that um, Andre will, will do the f uh, third part, understanding the relationship between CAM and OA. Thank you, Dr. Paul. So I have obviously a vested interest in uh, discussing this topic to you because it's uh, dear to my heart. It's the, one of the prime things that we're investigating with the PhD, looking at risk factors for hip and groin pain in football. So before we look at the relationship between CAM morphology and hip osteoarthritis, we need to look a little bit about what we know about CAM morphology and symptoms in the hip and groin. Once we've developed the FAI syndrome, as we mentioned, one of the key features is symptoms, we can then presume that there is a possibility of labral and chondral lesions occurring within that hip and the natural sequelae of that is osteoarthritis. So that's where the epidemic uh, comes from and this idea that we need to prevent all these hips from uh, becoming arthritic in the future. But what do we know about the association between CAM morphology and groin pain in athletes? Well, certainly there's been a number of studies published that have demonstrated an association between uh, CAM morphology in athletes that present with groin pain. However, we have a bit of a problem because we also see a high prevalence of CAM morphology in completely asymptomatic hips. What do we know about CAM morphology in the development of hip OA? Well, we've known since 1933 that an abnormally shaped femoral head seems to be associated with hips that, uh, that developed hip OA. So this is not a new phenomenon. And when we looked at large prospectively uh, population-based studies, both in Holland and in the UK, with very good, strong methodological um, choices, we were, we were able to find that 
there was a four times increased risk of developing HIPOA if you had a CAM morphology in comparison to those patients that didn't have a, a CAM morphology. If that bump was big and they have a predefined uh, method in which they determine the, uh, the large CAM, then your risk was increased up to 10 times. And interestingly, if the large CAM was combined with a stiff hip, so reduced internal rotation of less than 20 degrees, then your risk was increased up to 18 times between those that developed hip OA and those that, uh, that didn't. So what do we know about the prevalence of CAM morphology? As Paul said, it is very common in certain populations. We know it's more common in athletes than non-athletic controls. That's been established in many studies now. We also know that the higher level of play, so we can presume the higher amount of training that you have, you have undertaken, then you have a higher prevalence of CAM morphology in comparison to amateurs playing the same sport. And there does seem to be a dose dependence. So basically, the more you train, particularly below the age of 12, the higher the prevalence that you'll develop a CAM deformity and also a large CAM deformity. So here we get into this uh, hysteria, perhaps, that playing football and training at high levels is creating uh, arthritic hips. So we were interested in our population here in Qatar. As you can see, it's a multi-ethnic population playing pro, uh, professional football, and we were interested in how many of our players have a CAM um, morphology. So we undertook X-ray screening of 445 uh, football players, and I'd just like to acknowledge and thank uh, all the people that were involved in assisting with this study, particularly with NSMP and radiology and athlete screening. We conducted an AP and a 45 degree Dunn view, which is the best way to image the uh, femoral head neck um, region. And what we found was CAM morphology is very common. So if we look at the prevalence per hip, 60% of the hips of the football players here in the Qatar Stars League have CAM morphology. So is that an abnormality if more than half have it? And in terms of the large CAM morphology, which remember that can uh, perhaps create a 10 times increased risk of hip OA, 23% of the hips had a large CAM morphology. So if we look at player prevalence, because some of these are, are bilateral and some are unilateral, 72% of the players in the Qatar Stars League have a CAM morphology in one or both of their hips. The interesting thing is when we look at the relationship between CAM morphology and symptoms in these players, even though three out of every four football players has CAM morphology in their hip, we see a very low incidence of hip-related groin pain. Less than 1% of the groin injuries that were recorded in two years of our football season were uh, diagnosed as hip-related groin pain. In fact, it was two cases in the same player. So very uncommon. And um, our hip specialist surgeons are still itching at their fingers to, uh, to be able to do an arthroscopy on some of our football players. There hasn't been an indication. So then we were interested, okay, is there some ethnic differences in CAM morphology? And we were um, able to investigate these different ethnic groups. So basically five different ethnic groups. And um, as you can see, we have a low number of East Asian uh, football players here, but even with this low uh, number in the cohort, we were able to achieve statistical significance in terms of the prevalence of CAM deformity in these football players in comparison to the other ethnic groups, which were all relatively similar, around 60%. And when we looked at the prevalence of the large CAM morphology, the, the results were even more interesting. So we found that the Caucasian group had a statistically significant difference from the prevalence of the, uh, the black uh, football players that we have here. And in fact, there was no hip of the East Asian football players that had a large CAM deformity. So we thought maybe this is uh, something of importance. So when we look at the um, ethnic differences in hip OA rates around the world, we wondered if our data perhaps correlated with some of this. And sure enough, we find that the rate of hip osteoarthritis is highest in Europe, predominantly the Caucasian population. It's lowest in East Asia. And if you look at a country like the US, where there's mixed populations, we see this same disparity in the prevalence of hip OA, so highest in Caucasian um, people, 
the African American black population has a prevalence in the middle, and the East Asians in this country have the lowest rate of HIPOA. So there may be some sort of ethnic difference in prevalence of HIPOA rates. In terms of the Middle East, we don't have any large uh, HIPOA registers here, so it's hard to know the exact prevalence. But some of the preliminary report, reports suggest that the prevalence of HIPOA may also be lower here in the Middle East. So what explains this difference in prevalence? Well, it could be due to different activity levels in adolescence because we know that the CAM morphology is a, is a function of how much uh, uh, high impact loading we do during adolescence. But there could be many other explanations for why there is this ethnic difference. It may be related to cultural habits or it could be some sort of genetic or expression of genes. The interesting thing about our cohort is that it's likely they experience similar loads during adolescence. They've all reached a professional level of football. So the first, the most obvious reason why there, uh, there may be ethnic differences is probably not applicable to our cohort. So the ethnic differences that we found do correspond with what we know about geographical differences in HIPOA rates. And it's interesting that these differences existed despite the fact that it's likely all of these footballers had similar loading patterns during adolescence. So what does this mean? It brings up the nature versus nurture debate. Is HIPOA something that you're born and will naturally uh, uh, are destined to have? Is it something that's acquired through your sport or through your, through your habits or culture? Or is it something, a combination of, of the two, which most likely, uh, like everything in life, it is? So it may be that there are genetic differences in how the femur responds to the loading that's a, that, that, they, that it is, uh, is provided to it during adolescence. It could be that some ethnicities are protected from developing CAM morphology even if they have the same load as, their, um, as, 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 as the player next to them. It also may be that some ethnicities, even if they do develop CAM morphology, there may be something that protects them from developing femoroacetabular impingement syndrome and maybe even OA. We don't know the answers to these questions yet, but hopefully with longitudinal research, uh, particularly the study that uh, Dr. Paul Dykstra is going to be heading looking at de development of hip abnormalities in athletes here at, uh, at Aspatar and Aspire. And we need to further elucidate this relationship between the CAM morphology, hip and groin pain while playing sport, and long-term hip OA. And eventually, it would be lovely to develop some sort of injury prevention program that can perhaps uh, stop this progression of CAM morphology, uh, symptomatic uh, femoroacetabular impingement syndrome, and hip OA, if it's possible. So the take home messages for our talk, we would really encourage everyone to adopt the, this new terminology of femoroacetabular impingement syndrome with the three characteristics of symptoms, signs and imaging. Femoroacetabular impingement syndrome cannot be diagnosed on imaging alone. As you can clearly see from our data, the morphology is more common than not in, uh, in certain populations. We have this high prevalence of CAM morphology in the Qatar Stars League and there was ethnic differences in prevalence determined in our cohort. So are we sitting on a silent OA epidemic? We'll have to wait and see, but my gut feeling is our football players will all end up like this fellow, happily playing football without, uh, without any sign of hip OA. Thank you.